Well, let's bring in tonight's panel, journalist Sahar Zand and the foreign policy expert at the Henry Jackson Society, Aliona Hlivko. Good evening to, uh, to both of you. Um, Tyler, let, let's kick up with you. I mean, a very, very busy, tragic, politically charged couple of days. What do you think should happen next? What's happened is absolutely appalling. I think we can all agree. And people who are trying to save other people's lives shouldn't be killed. Um, a lot of people are arguing that what's happened now is one incident too many for it to have been um, another accident, as Netanyahu and Israeli officials have suggested. We know that 196, if I'm not mistaken, um, humanitarian aid workers have been killed in Gaza since the conflict began. And um, the founder of the NGO, World Central Kitchen, has said on his um, Twitter, um, formerly Twitter X, that Israel should stop using food as a weapon of war. A lot of agencies and NGOs and experts have been sounding the alarm bells for a long time for in the, in the past few weeks, saying that a famine is close and this was a particularly bad time for this attack because now a lot of NGOs, including the World Central Kitchen, which has been one of the biggest providers of food in, um, in Gaza, has pulled back their support. So what should happen? That's the million dollar question. There are so many things that need to happen. Some of the campaigners say there shouldn't be a war in the first place. Many others say, well, there is a war, but Israel should facilitate for aid workers and especially for food to be able to enter Gaza securely and safely. And a lot of, you know, they've said that they are going to be investigating this and governments, including our government and the US, has asked them to investigate this swiftly and to basically find out why this has happened. Yeah. But some say that that is not enough. Well, Aliona, let, let, let me turn to you. We, we've heard this, the request for mm. investigation, contrition from, from the Israeli government. Alison Bunkle, they're saying perhaps politicians today are a little more reserved. What's going to happen next, do you think? I think, first of all, we do need to wait for the outcome of investigation. And I know your Washington reporter was saying that those outcomes are not always public. But when you're at war and national security is at stake, not everything can be made public. Uh, I think the incident is completely intolerable because it does put... Uh, the lives of humanitarian aid workers under risk, and not just them, but also about two million uh, Gazan civilians um, are under risk of famine now. So the most important and horrific repercussion that we might be facing is the hold of that humanitarian aid going into Gaza Strip. But on the other hand, we do have under to understand that this is war. Uh, mistakes happen, and of course, they need to be investigated and see where there was negligence uh, conducted by the IDF, it was good to see that they've admitted to it straight away and that they are looking into seeing what went wrong. So, is there a risk here that this escalates? You know, we, we clearly, we, we saw the Israelis attacking the, the, the Iranian consulate in, in Damascus. How worried should we be that this is the match that lights an even bigger fire? I think the situation particularly in the Middle East, is so turbulent that everything, and there has been so many incidents, with everything that happens, this question rises. And with Iran's proxies supporting and being part of different parts of this war, I think this is something that is worrying a lot of people. And, Alena, I mentioned there Benny Gatz, that throwing, uh, talking of throwing matches onto fires. Mm. I mean, Netanyahu's just had surgery, he's recovering... If the Israeli political system is unstable, that has big ramifications, right? The Israeli political system has been unstable for a couple of years now. Yeah. Uh, that, unfortunately, is a given, and perhaps it's also driven the response mm. uh, to the Hamas attack on the 7th of October. Um, Netanyahu has almost no point of return, and, of course, he is a legitimately elected leader of Israel, and it's up to people of Israel uh, to decide his fortune and how the state is going to respond. Um, to uh, the Hamas attack and, and how to deal with them going forward. It, one thing is certain that Israelis do feel like this is an existential threat to them, that this is not just another flare-up um, in the 100-year-old conflict, mm. uh, if you will. It is something that they're taking very seriously and willing to go all the way. As is the word. Both. Thanks very much for the moment. Both. Uh, much more from you guys later on in the programme.
back with our panel now, Sahar Zand and Aliona Shlivko. And um, Aliona, you're a Ukrainian, so when we talk about preparedness for war, it is a subject you're, you're sort of grimly familiar with. But what do you make of the fact that the UK has no coherent plan of what to do if there's a war? Well, it's not surprising that after the post-Cold War era, uh, no nation in the world, including uh, Western democracies, are fully prepared for another World War III, if you'd like. Uh, we have entered a relatively safe era of trade uh, and normalization of international relations. Many people talked about the end of history, the mm. uh, famous Fukuyama theory, which I still think is coming, but it is going to be postponed because history does move in sine waves. Um, so the UK was not fully ready to face um, the security situation we are facing now in the world, but I think it's slowly waking up to the new reality. Sort of understandably complacent, we could call that. Unfortunately. So, uh, what do you what do you make of it? I mean, do politicians need to jump up and start doing things? I think the memory of COVID and the UK's unpreparedness is still very fresh in the public's minds, and the way it was handled. So, it's hardly surprising that Brits like myself are feeling, you know, the the pressure and. Um, it's quite shocking when we hear that UK's ministers say that they're not ready, mm -hmm. given the state of things, given where Russia is at, given where China, Iran, the state of the Middle East is at. So the prospect of war is very real and very near um, in a way that my generation at least hasn't seen because we have been involved in wars, but they've always been abroad and we've only seen the consequences from afar via terror attacks, you know, not many of us have been directly involved with it, but now it could happen. And remembering how COVID was handled, hearing that the UK says they're not prepared is really, really scary. But it's also important to kind of hear what the UK ministers are saying in the context of what's happening. It is election year. And when Grant Schapp, UK, Schapp's UK's defence minister, encourages NATO members to put more money in, it's not unheard of around a time like this um, for politicians to drum up um, votes by trying to raise money for the military. Let's just briefly bring up, we've got a little, a little graphic uh, here about uh, just the nations that have nuclear weapons. Mm. So there's five, five of them who, uh, who actually have these, these nukes. There we go, Russia, US, China, France, the United Kingdom. And there are other nations who, uh, who have them, Pakistan, India, North Korea. We can probably add Israel to that list, but, but it doesn't actually have it. Aliona, it, nuclear weapons, I mean, have they kept the peace or are they still a, a ter terrible risk to humanity? I think nuclear weapons is the greatest deterrent that Western democracies have today. And it's actually great luck that the UK does have its nuclear submarines. Um, that the United States provides that nuclear umbrella for Europe, including countries like Germany, um, who's given up their weapons after the Second World War and is now rearming. And of course, France is, is quite self-sufficient in that way as well. The biggest mistake we've seen that Ukraine has made, talking about being Ukrainian and being at war for 10 years, is giving up its nuclear weapons in 1994 mm -hmm. under the Budapest Memorandum. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just Ukraine, it was Belarus and Kazakhstan who gave up those weapons too. And now American President Bill Clinton is highly remorseful about that because mm -hmm. that could have been that important deterrent that could have stopped Russian aggression at its core. Uh, for the moment, both. Thank you very much. Well, Sahazan and Aliona Klivko are still here. Aliona, I mean, AI and music. I mean, at the heart of it, there's something quite important there, isn't there? It's very interesting to witness the fourth industrial revolution in action that grasps all of the areas of our life. It's not just generative AI and large language models. It's not just progression of AI in defense, but also in day-to-day -day life like music. And yes, it does need to be regulated. And we are now in the process of creating a new framework of our future existence. That is profound. So uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you make of this? I mean, music for so many people is such profound importance. Yes, and it's not just music that is being deeply impacted by AI, and it's not just musicians who are worried that AI is going to take over their jobs, their livelihoods, engineers, journalists, doctors. So many people are scared, and the, thoughts, the thought is that AI can actually do it better because it has all the information and it can produce so much more, and it can also create work in real-time, custom-made, 
to the receiver without the human error. But the fact of the matter is that people are going to be impacted, creatives are going to be impacted, doctors, engineers, journalists, and there needs to be regulations to protect them. The idea that you can replace journalists with AI is, is too fierce. That's too. the one thing that they can't do. Sahar, Ali, I'd like to see you. them try and come sit down here. I, I don't want to see them try. <laughs> uh, thank you both very much for your Scary company. Uh, that is uh, all for uh, tonight. News at 10 with uh, more on the growing pressure on the United Kingdom to suspend its arms sales to Israel. Thank you both indeed.